we're really grateful for the conversation that we're having today. And um, as we talk about diversity and hiring practices, we're going to give you a few more seconds to comment in the room. We see the numbers populating here. Okay. Good afternoon. Once again, I'm Bobby White with the Greater Memphis Chamber. We're very happy to have you all with us on this afternoon as we talk about diversity and hiring processes. And this is the fourth installment of our Strategies on Equity series. Uh, thank you to our Zoom sponsor, Southwest Tennessee, and to our series sponsor, of course, Independent Bank. We'll hear more from them in a moment. But to help drive today, we have two moderators who are great friends of the Chamber. Austin Baker, who you will hear from, Chairman Circle member, who you will hear from a little bit later during our question and answer portion of our discussion today. And my dear friend, and she is also the chair of the Women's Business Council with the Chamber, Dottie Summerfield Gusty. We're going to hear from her, and she is going to lead us further in today's discussion. So, Dottie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you so much. And like Bobby said, without our sponsors, we would not be able to bring you programs like we have today. And our thanks go to Independent Bank. And I'd like to introduce Antoinette Wiseman, Human Resources Manager for Independent Bank. Thank you, Dottie. And thank you everyone for joining this webinar on hiring practices and processes that promote diversity. Um, you know, here at Independent Bank, we're glad to be a sponsor and partner with the Chamber and bring this webinar in these series to you. Um, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart as HR manager here at Independent Bank. And um, we try to promote diversity in our company. So I'm very excited to hear about uh, processes or practices uh, that the panelists may have known or know or have done that can help us because, you know, diversity is very important to our community, to our company, and, and we just want to take advantage of this. So thank you so much. We appreciate you all. Back to you, Donna. Thank you, Antoinette. It's good to see you again. Um, today, we're going to spend some time talking about diversity and inclusion, but understanding that two things can happen at the same time. A company can be interested in a more diverse workforce while also inadvertently discriminating against other, some people in their hiring practices. Having hiring practices in place that reflect the interest in diversity is extremely important. So today we're going to try to provide some best practices that our human resources administrator perspective that can truly support and not undermine a company's commitment to diversity and inclusion. I'd first like to introduce to you David Dart. Dave, hi David. David joined ServiceMaster in August of 2018 as Chief Human Resources Officer and he comes with an extensive and long background leading organizations such as Veritas Technologies, a division of Selenies and other companies with global reaches. David has always strived to do, to create strategies for change. Um, David, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, uh, it's great being here and um, maybe we'll have some people from from FedEx on the line as well, uh, because you might hear, I live in Midtown and I live like right under the, uh, the, the plane. So uh, with, the, with the pandemic working from home, that's the, that's the only uh, noise I get usually. Um, so I appreciate the, the chance to talk to you guys today about this, this uh, topic. Um, I've been involved in, in human resources now for, for 20 years. And, uh, and, and I've been at a couple of companies that have done this really, really well. And I've been at a couple of companies where we had to move toward doing this well. And so I'll talk uh, around these six key areas, I think are really critical um, uh, practices that in order to actually achieve a diverse environment, um, particularly on the hiring side, I think you, you really need to focus on these six things. And it really starts with the business case development. Why are you doing this? I mean, why are you even talking about um, diversity as a, a, you know, at your organization? And if you're a for-profit company like, like the, the ones I work for, uh, there is a business case behind it. Yeah, yes, it's the right thing to do. But if that's, you know, if that's not in line with, with making money, 
sometimes that's not what ends up happening at, at businesses. If it's a legal requirement, you're trying to you know, risk mitigation or avoid litigation expenses, okay, that's a reason. If you're a government contractor and you, you are worried about the EEOC or the Office of Federal Contracts and Compliance Programs, they have rules and requirements. Um, you know, your affirmative action plan, all those things are critically important, but you might not be winning the hearts and minds of your managers and your and your organization if they don't understand the purpose of a diversity strategy and there's tons of research out there and it's important for you to bring that business case into the organization so that your managers are really invested in the business imperative because companies with diverse boards companies with diverse diverse executive teams and and companies with diverse uh a, a diverse workforce that is also inclusive, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, they just perf they perform better. There's a ton of research out there that shows that they do because they're bringing in different perspectives. And, and so without winning their hearts and minds there, they'll, just, they'll, they'll focus on the things that are mostly important to them, which is I gotta hire this job immediately. I gotta fill it right away. I'm so busy, I, I only have time to look at the first few can't, uh, people who've applied to the, or, to, to the job, and they won't really understand the long-term um, impact that the positive impact that that a, a, a diverse workforce brings to the company so i think that really does start start there but the second point is as important as the first um, you have to establish an inclusive environment where people have that sense of belonging and can bring their best selves to work every day if they don't have that you're going to hire a bunch of people that might look different but they won't stay long because they won't feel like they can bring um they they can't bring their best selves to work and so a couple of of uh, examples I'll use there. I work for a, a fantastic Fortune 500 company. The value creation there over the last 15 years in, in, in large part due to their culture inclusion initiative that they undertook 15 years ago. But when I was there, uh, the CEO told the story about um, they went down to visit a critically important global customer. And uh, it was a company out of, out of the Midwest. And, and they sat, sat the leader down and said, listen, you're not getting it. Uh, next time you come, don't bring the same five white guys. And they went back to the, you know, the, to their headquarters and said, ha ha, the joke's on them, we'll send five different white guys. The, the fact of the matter was they didn't have anyone else to send. But the, the, very, the global customer you would all recognize was like, look, you, you're, not a, you're not a reflection of our customer base and you're not a reflection of our employee base and you don't understand some of how they actually execute their job because you just can't relate because you guys don't have the kind of diversity of understanding of, of you know, where they come, came from and, and how they're actually executing their jobs. And you don't have that anywhere in your company and you're not, you're not understanding that. Uh, another uh, company I was with, um, very good uh, a consumer packaged goods company. We had a huge business um, in, in, uh, in popcorn. It was a $750 million popcorn business. And the margins on popcorn are incredible, by the way. And we were selling uh, one of our brands, uh, selling out in, in the Southern California in Los Angeles. And it was like, yeah, they love us in LA. They love us. And it, no one could explain why. why. Why in that metro area, we had sold way more popcorn of the specific brand than any other. And until um, two years had passed, um, Walmart was putting some pressure on us uh, to lower our costs. We wanted to take price. Uh, bushel of corn had skyrocketed. And so we were trying to take price. And, and they, they basically put us in the penalty box. Anyone who's worked with Walmart knows that that can sometimes happen to you. So we had to find other, uh, other um, revenue opportunities for, for ourselves. And uh, when we started looking at the markets, someone finally realized um, that the largest Mexican population, urban Mexican population outside of Mexico City in the world was in Los Angeles. And we hadn't, we hadn't understood that. And uh, so we were missing a huge opportunity because not only had uh, the, the Mexican American population adopted that brand as their brand, very brand loyal, they were, they were buying it and also shipping it back home uh, to uh, friends and family in Mexico uh, because we didn't sell it in Mexico. So what does that, it, it tells you if you shift and go, oh, maybe we should be selling you know, that popcorn brand in, in Mexico, that started our, uh, our multicultural marketing uh, opportunities and so we, we hired a multicultural marketing director and, and, and they've been very successful in targeting now more business opportunities and reaching you know a, a broader uh, customer base than they had before so 
those are a couple of quick examples of the business case. But then once we get people in, do they feel like they can bring their best selves? I mean, those two things have to come together or they won't stay. And the manager is just going to focus on, you know, I'm going to hire as quickly as I can, but then these people are going to leave because they don't feel a part of something. So um, there have been, you know, a lot of stories about people who have gone on diversity initiatives and put goals in place. But if the people don't feel that sense of belonging, they're going to leave and you've spent all that money bringing them in, but you know, you've disillusioned them and, and, and off they go. So those two things, and you can do the second one takes some time. If you don't have a diverse and inclusive environment, it may take several years. And that company I referenced who completely turned that around and is one of the best employers for people of color and, and women in, in, uh, in corporate America, uh, that wasn't where they started. And it took them years to get there, but now they are recognized. Um, the company's called Ecolab, and it's a fantastic company, but it, and it, it's, it takes that constant care um, and, and design of the culture and, and working towards it on a repeated basis to, to really shift to, uh, you know, from an exclusive club, which is what they were, to a, a truly inclusive workplace. And, and so it, that doesn't mean that you can't start on, on the, these other practices and processes, but I think that second one, if you if, if you, you might not have it now, don't expect it to change overnight. That's something that you have to be deliberate about over time. And we're doing that here at Service Master, and I, that's where we're setting some achievable goals for ourselves. Um, what, you know, I, we like to say, I used to be in the military, we, we'd say what gets measured gets done. And, and uh, I think that's very true. And so if you don't set some goals, you're not gonna make the progress that you need to make. And, uh, and for us um, here at Service Master, we needed to understand what, what is our gap? Um, you know, we get a lot of questions, particularly with this current, you know, environment with the social unrest that we're dealing with. You know, our, we have about 20% of our employee base is black. And, and, and we have, you know, not only was the whole organization going through some anxiety, but I think our black African American population of employees was, was really, you know, they're hurting, you know, and so we had to make uh, you know, a concerted effort to listen, to reach out and understand, you know, what's going on. A lot of the questions we got in our listening sessions was, well, we're in Memphis, we're headquartered in Memphis, you know, Memphis is 62, 63% black African American in the city. Why, why isn't our executive team, you know, at 62, 63%? And so those kinds of questions, you have to actually lean into discomfort and, and allow those questions to come forward. And, and so how do you address those? Well, you know, if we look at, we're a nationwide uh, company, and if, if the census is, says it's 13% Black African American in the U.S., should we be at least a reflection of that? Well, I think the answer to that is yes, and we are not. You know, we are about 4 or 5%, between 4 and 5% of our director and up population is Black or African American at, at Service Master, yet our overall population is, is a little over 20%. And, and so you have to start being honest and open uh, with your employee base about where you are from a representation standpoint and realize that we might have a, a, you know, a barrier, a, a ceiling here where it's hard for people to come from manager and supervisor roles into that director level population. Why is that? You know, are we really, are we, do we have processes that promote uh, the acquisition of talent at director and up? But are we also investing internally to make sure that we're developing and, and allowing people that career path? which makes it, again, an, uh, 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 an attraction for people to come and, 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 uh, and join the companies because they know they can grow their career. So you have to know how bad the gap is. So we understand, is it, it sh should it be 13? Should it be 62? Or, you know, I think a really good goal for us, which is one we've adopted, is that, you know, over time, we should be closer to 20%. If, you know, we're here in the, in the Central South, this is where we probably should be at director and up would be more of a reflection of what the rest of our employee base would be. That makes a lot of sense for us. And because if you go back to my first comment about, you know, litigation, avoidance, and those sorts of things, uh, we'd say, well, we're good. I mean, you know, from, from, if you looked at our numbers, our raw numbers, we don't have any exposure on equal pay, or we don't have any exposure on uh, overall representation. You know, you, so you'd say, okay, well, we're good. We don't have to do anything. But actually, you go back to the business case, and we do, and then you look at the numbers a little bit deeper and be rational about it, we should be closer to 20% at director and up at our company. And, and so then that requires us to do um, some of the things that I talk about in the, on, the, on the right side. So 
we've created this role in talent acquisition and I would, I, if you have the ability to do it and it doesn't have to be a, a single role like we have, because we have about 40 people in our talent acquisition organization. There's about 11,000 people at service master direct employees and 40,000 franchise employees. So of these 11,000 that we have, um, you know, we have, we, we hire about 5,000 people a year. Um, and, and so we need to make sure that we have, you know, a, a good talent acquisition organization that can support that. But we've created a role in talent acquisition that's specifically focused on uh, diversity recruiting. And, and I think you do need to do that, even if it's put someone puts a hat on as a collateral duty and they're responsible for it. Because if, if too many people have the accountability to create a, a strategy around diversity recruiting, then no one really has the accountability. And that's where that, you know, if too many people have the A, no one has it. Um, and, and I think it's important to have somebody responsible for setting, helping to develop the strategy. They might not be the most strategic person in the world, but they have to be responsible for going through the strategic process of setting, hey, look, here are, here's the strategy that we have. Here are the diverse talent pools we're going after. Here are the key capabilities that we need to acquire out in the market. And, and by, by establishing that, you, you get to the, the identification of, of, uh, of the diverse pools that you're going after. Um, you might want to say it's a military recruitment strategy. I have a university recruitment strategy. And um, which marketing boards uh, do I, and job boards do I want to do? So what marketing do I want to do? What job boards am I going to access? Um, you want to make sure that you're establishing service level agreements for diversity of slate with your hiring managers. So that you have, you know, maybe you say, look, on 85% of our, of our uh, hiring slates, which means the kind of the interview slate, uh, I want, um, you know, one female and one person of color because we're underrepresented at director or above in both places at Service Master. And so it's, this is what we have to do to work on that. So you, you put someone in place that, that makes sure that they can create the strategy, the plan and the process to, to make a difference. And there's a lot in there, um, as I just kind of went through those pretty quickly. And also, when you think about a university, university recruitment strategies are fantastic, but you have to have the training program in place to make them successful. And, and at ServiceMaster right now, we're more used to um, experienced hires. And so if we say, okay, we're gonna now go to historically black colleges and universities, but we don't have training programs, we're gonna hire a bunch of people and again, lose them because we, have, we don't have this, this great training program that's gonna allow them to be successful in the role. So, so you have to be careful about how you set your, you can't just say we're gonna do everything, you know, make sure that it fits for your business. Uh, the next thing's on training, and, and we can't tell our hiring managers to go hire for more diversity and then expect them to actually deliver on that. You have to, you have to show them how. So you, if, they, if you got their, their focus on the what, they get the what, right? They knew they need to change. They, they understand the business case. They're invested. They have goals. They want to achieve them. But if you don't help them th uh, on, on the how, then you're actually going to miss the mark. And that's why things like behavioral interviewing, as an example, really uh, uh, try to mitigate some of the unconscious bias that occurs. Tons of studies um, show that, that like refers like, uh, like hires like. And we are no different here. I've gone through the numbers here at ServiceMaster, but uh, my, my first uh, experience in, in corporate America, we looked at our, we had a very lucrative um, uh, a referral program and we had if you looked at all the graphs of like okay where did our where are hiring sources and who referred those people in 95 percent across every uh race group uh were referred in um like race and so if you already have a a, a representation issue if you're trying to build a diverse workforce uh, a referral program may not help um, because unconscious bias is a is a real thing um, just the way the brain works. And so if doing things like behavioral interviewing, understanding the need to make sure that you give the uh, requisition posting time enough to build out a diverse slate, those sorts of things you have to teach your hiring managers how to do that. And, and so there has to be some training element to make sure that selecting top talent and the, uh, and the uh, diversity is a competitive advantage are well known. Uh, lastly, um, and then I'll, I'll uh, quiet down and, and turn up, turn the mic over, but, uh, uh, is this focused assimilation. It's related to establishing an inclusive environment, but that sense of belonging, a quick start on the sense of belonging, um, being delivered on onboarding, uh, it's, a, it's a huge thing for retention overall, um, you know, because you can get everything right on quality of hire, and, uh, but if you don't assimilate people uh, well and they feel like, ah, oh, you know, it sounded great, but now I'm not feeling very good, a lot of people actually make the decision to leave an organization and do a quick turn within the first six months. 
So really being delivered about the first, you know, 90, 100 days for, for your employees as you hire them, particularly if you're on a diversity initiative, because, you're, you know, you're going to be building towards some goals. Those, you know, some of these people that you hire in may not feel welcome um, and they don't see a lot of people that look like them. And, and uh, so making sure that they feel that broader sense of belonging uh, to, to the, the, you know, the bigger picture of the, of the company as opposed to looking for people who might have the same experiences for them is really critically important. So you have to be deliberate about that too. Just hiring and quickly, hey, you know, welcome, go get them, isn't, isn't enough if you're changing, um, you know, the, the strategy for the company. So with that, I'll, I'll quiet down and, and uh, turn it over. Thank you very much, David. Appreciate it. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce you to John L. Evans. This is a personal welcome for me. Um, I was lucky enough to work with Janelle years ago and help her join Medtronic. After that, after a long career with International Paper and a short stint in Utah, Janelle is now the Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion for Becton Dickinson's Human Resources team. Uh, she's an important member of their team. She's entrusted with maintaining the happiness of their employees, whether it's through perks, benefits, or ensuring low burnout rates, which we're all faced with right now. Welcome, Janelle, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Dottie. So glad to be here with you today. <clears throat> thank you to, to you, Dottie and Bobby, for um, inviting me to share with you today. I really appreciate the opportunity to give back to Memphis um, and to be back in Memphis, even if it is virtual. Um, <clears throat> so you may be wondering, how it is that I'm a part of this conversation today. So just a little background on me. And Tundra, are you pulling up the deck for me, please? So while she's doing that. Um, a little background on me. I'm currently in New Jersey, uh, but I'm originally from Chattanooga. And I attended the University of Memphis undergrad. Um, but after grad school, uh, I was living in Virginia and working in Virginia and a little something called love uh, actually brought me back to Memphis. Um, and I lived there for another 11 years uh, working in HR at Honeywell Medtronic. Uh, thank you, Dottie. Uh, and, and International Paper. My children were born there. They attended school there, Harding, Briarcrest, BDS, Hutchison. Many of my closest friends and, and a lot of my family are still there. We were Grizzlies fans. We are Grizzlies fans. Um, you know, I could go on, but I say all that to say, my family and I were very much in love with Memphis um, and so much so that we really couldn't let it go completely. Um, Tundra, do we have my slides? Janelle, it's Amy Daniels, and Tunja is yeah. having some computer issues. Are you able to pull it up okay. from your side? Sure, let's see. Uh, hang on, where did it go? The magic of telecommunications okay. we all struggle with these days. It was there. I was just about to say, welcome to Zoom. Everything can happen. That's the beauty of this. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Um, uh, here we go. Are you, you got it? Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're so happy to have you all here. Great. There you go. Is this working? Is this working? Yes. Okay. So let me see. All right. So you can see my deck, is that Yes, right? perfect. Okay, good. All right, well, I'm just trying to work through it on my side. All right, so I said all that to say, we still love Memphis. This is a picture of uh, actually the room that I'm in. Uh, <laughs> my kids' chairs, we were Memphis fans and we couldn't let go so much that uh, we named our dog Memphis. Uh, so we're, we're truly loyal Memphians, whether we're still there or not. Um, but I've, I've worked in human resources for over 20 years. 
um, various industries. I've lived in various cities across um, the country, but one of the things that, that I do know, because I did uh, actually work in human resources, and by the way, every, every HR role I've ever had, uh, had a little portion of recruiting associated with it, uh, if not full ownership of it. Um, but one of the things I know, regardless as to the different companies I worked in in Memphis or the different cities that I, I lived in uh, in the country, I know full well the challenges uh, with just recruiting in general. Um, you know, top talent, um, whether it's within Memphis because it is such a competitive market for talent uh, or whether it's really wooing uh, top talent into the city. So I, I have an appreciate, full appreciation for that. Um, so that being said, I want to kind of talk through just a few things today. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't at least to some extent address the current climate. Um, and quite likely uh, the source of us actually having this conversation today and many similar conversations that are going on literally across the globe. Um, then I wanna offer you just some successful practices, um, things that I've seen that I've used uh, in various organizations that I've worked for uh, specific to uh, talent sourcing, but also mitigating bias in the hiring process. And then I'll close with just a personal ask I have of you as business leaders um, around challenging some, some perceptions. So we'll talk through that a little bit in a moment. But I, I, it really does make me proud to see that um, the business community in Memphis really cares about this enough to have this conversation. And I know these conversations are tough. Um, you know, when you look at the current climate, right, there's, there's a lot going on right now. Um, there are a lot of uh, emotions uh, that are heightened. There are um, a lot of people who've gotten to the place of um, no longer tolerating um, the types of things that we're seeing. And it's, it's kind of a, almost a, a remarkable phenomenon, right? Because, um, you know, for, for the black community, this isn't new. Uh, and, and you know, that's what, that's what we're saying, that's what we're feeling, this isn't new. Um, this didn't start with Breonna Taylor or Ahmaud Arbery or George Floyd. Um, this has been this has been a problem for years. Um, for people in the non-black community, they're asking lots of questions, right? I mean, what can I do? How can I help? How can I be better? Um, and it's not just people; it's organizations also. Uh, companies are asking those same types of questions, and and it's it's. It's fascinating to a lot of people that we've finally gotten to this place. Um, but what I'll tell you about the way I view it, as well as my role, um, we, have, we have an audience. Uh, I, as a leader of inclusion and diversity, have an audience I have never had before. Um, there are many more leaders uh, really paying attention um, and, and really caring about driving change. Not to mention, um, and, and David said this earlier, you know, we, we have to understand that our Black employees are not okay, right? Um, they're not okay with what we've seen. They're not okay with um, how we're feeling. And they need to hear from their employers um, that there's a certain level of awareness around what's going on. Um, and so, you know, just uh, an example, some things that my company did, right? Many companies put out public statements um, about 
you know, their disdain and intolerance for, for what uh, they were seeing. We did the same thing. We put out public statements internally, externally, um, like Service Master, we had conversations uh, across the organization. We had some really courageous leaders uh, who took on um, and, and took advantage of the opportunity to really drive dialogue within their organizations. Um, we put out resources, right? We, we developed a resource guide for our employees and leaders on, you know, how do you, how do you have this conversation within your family, with your community, with your colleagues, um, as well as with, um, for leaders with their teams. So, uh, you know, various resources we made available to help them facilitate those conversations. Like many other organizations, we made a contribution. Um, we did to the Equal Justice Initiative. We leveraged our public affairs uh, team to talk to us about advocacy and what advocacy looks like um, to drive political change. Um, and then from a, a business perspective, we also participated in the, the Facebook uh, boycott uh, stop hate for profit over the course of uh, the month of July. So we withheld all of our uh, marketing um, dollars, along with you know many other large companies, probably some of you as well. Um, but you know it's we did a lot, right? Um, and so I think you know it, it was it was a lot of communicating. And yes, you know, we made an investment and yes, you know, we, we put our money where our mouth is. Um, but I was having a conversation with our CEO and executive team a couple of weeks ago. And I said, you know, it's, it's not enough. You know, we, yes, we did a lot and we should be very proud of the way that we addressed this and how we responded, you know, to such a difficult situation, but it's not enough because what people want to see is that we're walking the talk. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you how we know that. Uh, you know, there are a lot of companies like us who posted, you know, our positions on social media. And there, did you know that there were actually people who went back to those company posts and challenged those companies, show us your board of directors? show us your executive team. Uh, so that didn't go over very well, as you can imagine. Um, another thing, if I, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with um, ESG, um, so that's environmental, social, and governance, um, but it's the sustainability and social change that investors uh, look at when, when they look to um, invest in, in organizations. And so um, BlackRock, for example, puts out a communication every year um, to, to explain and communicate their expectations of organizations that when it comes to things like sustainability and, and governance, uh, that diversity and inclusion is a part of that, um, how diverse is your board of directors because they communicate a diverse board makes better decisions. Um, you know, are you living your stated commitment to diversity? Tell us what your diverse, the, the representation within your workforce looks like. Um, it's actually kind of been taken a, a notch up uh, now. They're actually investors who are sending letters to companies saying, uh, in light of police brutality and companies making these public statements, we're asking you to disclose even more detail about the representation of your workforce and they're asking us to turn over certain documents that are typically private and confidential. Um, and if we don't, then that could impact their investment decisions. So, you know, again, I say all of that to say, clearly this isn't going away. This didn't go away with, you know, the next news cycle. 
Um, there's a new uh, level of accountability um, that uh, investors have of us as organizations, that our employees have of us as organizations, and certainly prospective talent. You know, you know uh, two of the most common interview questions right now are about uh, how did your company respond to COVID? What did you do for your employees? And how did your company respond to George Floyd's murder? People are asking that in the interviews because it's impacting decisions that they make because they want to understand the type of organization that they're going to work for. So um, why does all of that matter? Well, it certainly uh, is, is the right frame of reference uh, that we need to have as we think about how we even approach drawing, attracting diverse talent to our organizations. We have to, under, we have to really have a good understanding of the current climate and how we as organizations are responding to it. But I do want to offer um, just a few successful practices. I'm not going to go in depth into any of these. I really want to offer them as, you know, maybe something to pique your interest, uh, maybe something to offer something you've never thought about before, or, or maybe to reinforce uh, some of the things that you're doing. Um, but just a few successful practices here when we consider uh, how we go about sourcing diverse talent. And candidly, it's, it's outreach. Um, you know, when you think in terms of how you even approach recruiting diverse talent, you, you really need to understand and, and, and be strategic about it and, and take a targeted approach. You need to understand where the needs and opportunities are within your organization to be impactful. Where do you have gaps uh, in your diverse representation in your organization? That's a good place to start. Uh, David mentioned compliance. Right, if you're a federal contractor looking at your affirmative action plans and the goals there, that's a really smart place to start. Um, and then, you know, not just, uh, you know, posting a job and seeing who responds. If you're really being targeted about it, you're targeting the markets that you actually recruit in. And so you're looking for where is the availability of the diverse talent with the types of skill sets that you're looking for? And there's actually applications and software and all that sort of good stuff that, that can do that for you. Um, leveraging social media, uh, posting jobs. Uh, a lot of companies, if you look at LinkedIn, for instance, post jobs with pictures of diverse people. Um, that's one clear way to communicate that your organization is one that values diversity and is a place where people um, from various demographics or parents, um, uh, people with disabilities, veterans, et cetera, it, it definitely demonstrates that your organization has an appreciation for diversity and, and could be a, a place where they could feel they belong. Um, with university relations, I heard David uh, speak to, you know, HBCUs, um, and I agree, you know, you, if you're going to approach uh, colleges and universities, you should be strategic about that as well. Um, and really factor in what are the demographics of the schools that you go to, for instance, um, when I was at Medtronic in Memphis, we were looking to bring in some early career engineers and we it we were specifically focused on bringing in a diverse group of early career engineers and so i did a lot of research from a regional standpoint where the schools that have the uh, strongest diversity demographics and uh ended up at georgia tech um but also tuskegee so we had a bit of a balance uh with an hbcu and, and a, um a school that wasn't uh, specific to demographic. Um, your employee value proposition matters, right? Are you marketing your, your organization to meet the diverse talent expectations? That's absolutely something to consider. And then do you leverage professional uh, organizations? There are a lot of professional organizations out there that are very specific to diverse talent, 
On the left, you see some examples of one that, ones that actually have chapters in Memphis. Um, partnering with them is a great way um, to actually, you know, deliver on that outreach and, and improve your diverse talent sourcing. Um, and I'm trying to move quickly because I know we're, we're getting close to time. Um, but successful practices around mitigating bias. You know, there are several things that you can do in that respect. A lot of organizations are blinding resumes. So they're removing all, you know, identifiable details from resumes and applications uh, to level the playing field uh, on the consideration process. Um, having diverse interview slates and panels uh, is one way to help to mitigate bias because if you can ensure, the more diversity you have on a slate, uh, for interviews, the greater, obviously, right, the likelihood that you will actually hire diversity. And there's quite a bit of research out there around that. Um, establishing metrics, David spoke to that. Really looking at your job postings, you know, assessing your job postings for any potential bias language, and then just really analyzing your applicant flow data, right? Do you have people actually applying for your jobs who are diverse? And then really looking at you know, each step of the applicant flow process to see at any point, uh, are you losing diverse talent? And so wrapping it up, uh, my ask of you is just challenge perceptions, um, your own perceptions and those of, and those of others um, that you work with around diverse talent. Uh, because there are a lot of perceptions, a lot of biases that impact um, how well you do at actually hiring diverse talent because you might have some some biases and preconceived notions um and so that's, that's it. you know just please please address the current climate uh your employees need to know that your prospective talent needs to know that you care um broaden your talent sourcing efforts take a hard look at yourself your internal systems uh, and then again, challenge your perceptions. Thank you, Janelle. And just for everybody, I promise you that all of the information that both David and Janelle have shared with you, with us today, will be available to you. David, do you want to join us again? Turn your camera on. And there's Austin Baker. There you go. To kick us off with some questions. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, Dottie and David and Janelle. I, I think that those are great presentations. As an HR professional and consultant, I think that y'all did a wonderful job of encapsulating a lot of best practices. And I really appreciated, you know, some of your personal notes as well. You know, I think that we are, uh, no doubt, in, in a, you know, a, a, new, a new normal, not only just driven by COVID, no doubt, but also, you know, from the social side of things. And so with, the, with our culture today, where we are, you know, I think that um, as I've reached out to friends to try to, Help me better understand things as well. You know, I've asked them to say, "Hey, you know, would, would you tell me where my blind spots are? You know, would you tell me, you know, where perhaps I'm, you know, I need to have a different type of conversation?" You know, company culture is important. So my first question for you is, you know, with with, uh, with people, you know, trying to uncover those unconscious biases and those things like that. You know, I think that uh, how do you, how do you facilitate having the conversation and just asking the question or saying the thing? in a positive way in your culture, in a way that it really helps to break down some of those walls. You want to take that? Yeah. I'll take it. Sure. Um, you know, we actually have a, a training that, that we deliver to all of our employees and, and we call it conscious inclusion. So it's not unconscious bias. We're taking it to the next level and teaching you uh, what good looks like. And so we encourage in our culture people to ask curious non-judgmental questions is is what we call it um and and to be open and we also teach uh in our training how to respond when people do right you know assume good intent um but we do strongly encourage asking curious non-judgmental questions and um and 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 being vulnerable right because i think that when people see that you have positive intentions, you're actually being vulnerable by putting yourself out there saying, I don't, or can you help me understand? Um, you know, people have a better appreciation for that and respond accordingly. 
Yeah, and the, the one thing I would add is, uh, you know, this, this, the, the conversations that I've had over the course of the last couple of months has been very different than any, I've, than any conversations I've had about race in, in my entire lifetime, really, but certainly in my career. And, and, uh, and, and they are uncomfortable. And I worked with uh, Khalil Jameson, which is a, is a pretty well-known uh, diversity and inclusion um, consultant. And, and the, back, back years ago, and I've worked with him at Equal at Sony's and now, now here at Service Master, um, because they do teach so well about leaning into discomfort and listening as an ally. And, you know, how do you create a sense of belonging? Those things are really difficult um, for organizations to, to, to have that become the fiber of how you do, do work together. Um, um, but I, I, I do appreciate the, the, I think that most people, at, at least at my company today, are, are listening as, and challenging as an ally. So not just listening as an ally, but challenging as an ally, because I think we have at least a foundation of, of, uh, of believing that the company is trying to do the right thing, um, but we, we, we aren't hitting the mark of where we, we need to be. Um, leaders really do have to put themselves open, be vulnerable. I totally agree with that. That's, that's absolutely critically important. And if, if, uh, if you show that vulnerability and actually say, I'm seeking to understand, I'm listening as an ally, you'll, you'll find that you'll get a lot more information. The one thing that's been challenging about that is we've heard, we've heard some things that made us uncomfortable too. So careful what you ask for. You're going to ask for the feedback and how are people feeling? And then you hear, well, well wait a second. So you've got to be careful not to get defensive, you know, when you hear some of, some of how people are feeling. Um, and you might be able to help change perspective and give greater context, but, you know, getting defensive is going to shut the organization down. So as you lean into that discomfort and as you listen as an ally, don't be surprised what you get back, you know, that some of it might hurt your feelings and as a leader, and then you have to take that as a, as a leader, you have to take that in and understand it and actually meet them where they are and, and help them along. Um, and, and they could really change your perspective as well. So this is, I, you know, I'm really energized about the time right now because I do think this is not just a moment. I do believe it's a movement. You've heard that. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is not going away this time, in my opinion, and, and so I, I'm 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 uh, excited about that. Thank you for your answers on that. I thought those were both um, outstanding examples of kind of how to make the conversation real, um, how to help people have better conversations. Yeah, you know, my my next question is about the notion of, um, of of proximity. You know, I think that if you travel, you know, east and west on Poplar, you look at a lot of the same things, but when you go north and south it looks different, you know, and I think that, it, you know, some of my richest relationships are the, are my most diverse relationships that I value the most. And that's something I've sought out, you know, how do we help? Cause you talked about the referrals kind of being fairly homogenous, right? Cause it's sometimes because people have friends that kind of look like them a lot, mm -hmm. you know, how, and especially in today's age, you know, so I'm gonna throw a twist on this from a proximity standpoint, you know, how do we help increase that in the organization? both maybe through volunteerism, uh, through other types of work to help bring in more talent. And in today's age where virtual you know, is our norm, that's probably gonna be, how are we gonna source talent outside of what, where we thought about place you know, to bring proximity uh, to that diversity in your workplace? Well, you know, one thing um, I can say, so um, I don't know how many uh, organizations represented here have this type of flexibility but one thing I can say COVID has done is it has certainly changed the landscape of uh, what the workplace looks like right um, there are companies that have I mean we've seen it right Google and others have just said oh don't come back for the next year <laughs> um, we still have not gone back to work We've been out working from home since March 12th. Um, we don't know when we're going to bring the broader workforce back. And even when we do, if it's going to be any, everyone. And I say all that to say, I think it has certainly presented an opportunity. And I'm talking to a lot of my colleagues at other companies about this because they're, they're looking at it the same way. The, the workplace is different now. And if the workplace is in your home, that absolutely broadens the pool, particularly from a diversity standpoint, right? If people don't have to physically relocate, come into an office in a certain location, 
yeah, the, the pool of diverse talent is unlimited. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one potential way to approach it. And for, for us, uh, you know, I think, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the understanding the diverse talent pools that are, that are out there and available. And, and I think you do have to do research on that. And some of it is, is again, I, I think I, I, I'm biased towards a role that has this as part of their accountability where they're actually responsible for tracking the diverse hiring agencies that we use. So we use a lot of hiring agencies. Have we really questioned the, their track record of success of building diverse slates for us? You know, there are certain uh, niche companies that have provided that, um, uh, but we, have we really brought them in? And a lot of them are minority and women owned businesses that should be a supplier anyway, right? Because we're looking at our supplier diversity right now too, because we haven't really asked the question very much. This, this has been really helpful for service master to really take it. Hey, wait, where are we? Like, let's really, let's stop, let's stop pretending, you know, or let's, let's stop ignoring or let's stop being oblivious to the fact of, you know, we are where we are. And so, so that's another way that we can kind of bring, bring into Rostel, but then you, you start to track, okay, what is our success rate on the places that we are posting and understanding? And so having someone bring that data up in front of us on a continuous basis. But one of the most important things I think is to really get comfortable with, with each other. And I've had the, you know, the great pleasure of working, you know, of, of growing up in a diverse school, of going to diverse college, of being in the military, of so I'm very comfortable with people from all walks of life, but not everyone is because, you know, again, maybe it's East, West, I'm popular, North, South, I'm pretty new here, but I got that reference. <laughs> if, you, if you haven't found a way to, um, to, to get comfortable and, you know, when you have a dinner party, does everyone look the same? You know, that's an interesting question that we've been asking ourselves here at Service Master recently. And, and you know, when you get involved in the community, in a meaningful way uh, and you start to meet people and start to build friendships and relationships because you're spending part of your time out there in the community making a difference like communities and schools is one of my favorite organizations to, to spend time with in this in, in in the city because they are trying to do something at the at the you know the k through 12 level you know and, and trying to really start to invest in children you know and, and think that can make a big difference for the city in the future i, I agree with that but you start to build relationships with people through that. And now, you know, we're, we're, you know, you become friends and you, you know, and that really does help you open your mind and, and helps the conscious and unconscious bias over time. It, it, it really does. And so I, I think getting involved in the community is, is critically important for people to, to open their aperture a bit. Well, thanks, David. Thanks, Janelle. I'm going to hand it back to Dottie to ask the last question and help to hand it off for a close. Great presentation. Outstanding responses. We appreciate you very much. Thanks, Thanks. Austin. It's good to see you. Glad to have you with us. And this is kind of for, for both of you. Um, and you both talked about unconscious bias, which is probably the most change is hard. It's hard for everybody. It's hard for people to be accepted. It's hard for people to be accepting. It's hard for us to understand where our failings are. Mm -hmm. um, and you both talked about unconscious bias. Um, how do we teach it? How do we make people aware that what they're doing really is biased? Um, Janelle, you've talked about programs you've changed. You changed some wording that was a little bit, that was fascinating. Conscious inclusion uh, training. So the way we approach teaching about unconscious bias is we try to take people off the defensive straight out of the game and explain that bias is merely a preference, right? And so people have all sorts of preferences. You have a preference, you like Walmart or Target. Um, you know, and, and it is a preference is that simple. And it's, and it, a preference doesn't necessarily have a negative, negative connotation, but when you, when you say unconscious bias, it does. And so what we teach people is those preferences are built solely on your background, right? And there are all these different, you know, aspects of, of your background, you know, where you grew up in the South, and I'm in the North now, uh, but where you grew up, you know, the, the school that you went to, the friends that you had, you know, the church that you go to, all of those things make up really 
the lens through which you see the world. And it's not the same for any two people. No two people's experience is completely the same. And so that's how we, we kind of lay the foundation with people to say, a bias isn't necessarily bad, but it's when the lens through which you see the world starts to impact the way you engage with people, the way you judge people, the way you interact, the decisions that you make, um, particularly with leaders. Um, so we try to take people off the defensive, really break it down to the bare minimums and help them build a level of self-awareness and understand why they see the world the lens that they do and then what they can do um, to improve their interactions with others. Thank you. David, you want to finish? Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that um, is, uh, and again, I, I, I was very fortunate to have, to have, you know, walked in where Cleo Jameson was, was building, you know, an incredible program, but um, unconscious bias training, um, or um, I like your conscious inclusion, that, 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 that makes a ton of sense to me, uh, isn't, isn't the easy button answer, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the one thing I would, I would advise anyone who's thinking about that as, as a, hey, I'm going to roll out unconscious bias training. Uh, it, it's, it's not, it's not enough to change, to truly change behaviors and to change culture. Um, it is helpful and it should be incorporated with a lot of other things that are going on to actually change the trajectory of the organization. And so uh, don't lean on that. And sometimes, you know, actually Fred, Fred Miller, who, who I talked to and who's, from Quill Jameson, he, he asked me, he's like, why are you starting here? You know, why are you starting with unconscious bias training? I said, well, we want to get the ELT aware, right? So we, we start the executive leadership team and then we're, we're, you know, but what, what we do now, that doesn't mean we're going to go out and do this across the network of 50,000 employees. We, we need to be delivered about what we're going to do and how we're going to respond. And so it's not, it's not the, it's not the easy button answer. You know, it's a part mm -hmm. of a mindset and a, um, um, culture change. Thank you. Hey, Bobby, are you there? Um, thank everyone for being here. Uh, Janelle, David, it was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Back and forth thank with you. you guys. Yeah, and thank you all. Uh, let me thank Dottie and, and Austin for moderating today, especially you, Dottie, for uh, getting us uh, engaged here and uh, David and Janelle, we really appreciate it. Let me, before you all leave us, uh, I just wanted to uh, just uh, get this um, uh, one thought uh, from you all um, as we move forward here. Um, with where we are um, and, and the impact that we have actually seen um, in, in the workplace, um, I'm wondering it, what, what have you learned um, uh, just based on what we've seen in these last several months. Uh, what, what new strategies or, or what things have you learned through those conversations? What blind spot has been un unveiled for your company uh, based upon some of the conversations you've had, those open conversations you've had in, in recent months? Just quick short answers. We don't have but like two minutes, but just wondering what blind spots have you guys kind of talked about? I'm interested. I could say one thing. I mean, I, I've learned a ton. So uh, I've learned more in the last couple of months about this than I ever thought possible. And, I, and actually where, where some people were feeling. But the, the biggest thing, that, the biggest aha for me has been, I, I was talking to a, a former work colleague about this too. If you're, if you're Black in corporate America, it was like the rules of Fight Club. Um, uh, the first rule of Fight Club is don't talk about Fight Club. The second rule of Fight Club is don't talk about Fight Club. The, the, if you're black in corporate America, first rule about talking about race is don't talk about race, right? And the second rule is don't talk right. about race, you know, and, and, we, and we haven't been, you know, uh, honestly, as, 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 as exposed as I've been, like, that's the one thing I'm like, we really haven't. We've been talking about bias and skirting around some of these issues of how people feel. That's been the biggest aha for me at, at our company and also just for me as a leader. Wow. What about you, Janelle? Any, any, anything on, on that line? That's, that's a great point, David. I really appreciate that. It really is. And, and I'll just say, um, you know, we, we tackled this topic head on and it's something we probably never would have talked about if, if these events didn't occur. And what it's done is really open uh, and even broaden the dialogue around these types of tough topics. I mean, we went from there to uh, health inequities in the black and brown communities 
we uh, talked about COVID bias towards Asian Americans. Our next one is on masculinity. So, I mean, it's really kind of opened that door for us in our culture to get some of these issues that typically stay outside of the workplace on the table. Wonderful. Listen, thank you all again. Um, um, I am absolutely, and Beverly Robertson, are you on the line? I know she was double booked here, uh, but I wanted to at least recognize Beverly, uh, who had been listening in earlier. Uh, but again, I just wanted to thank you all so much for being a part of this conversation. It's been fascinating information. Even those closing remarks are seared in my brain there. So thank you all so much on behalf of Beverly and the entire team. Again, uh, Dottie and Austin, you guys thank have been you. great. Janelle, David, we appreciate guys so much. I want you all to have a great day, lovely afternoon, rest of your day. And if you're in Memphis, well, it's sunny now, but stay out of the rain. It's coming. Y'all yeah. take care. Have a Thank great you. day. Beverly, Beverly made it in. Beverly, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I know you can't see me, but look, I enjoyed this conversation so, so much. I almost wish we could have a longer session about all of this. Uh, David made some excellent comments, as did Janelle. Uh, and I think all of us can take something away today and begin to put it, you know, to practically apply it to our respective organizations. So thank you, Austin. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dottie. I really appreciated it very much. So have a great day and, and check with us next Thursday because we'll have the final session on this series. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.